Ezekiel 37, 7 says God can restore life to something that was that at one time had life. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and bones came together bone to bone. Put your hope in God this week, all right? Amen. Let's rattle, rattle.
that hope in our heart today, God. Lift us up with your breath of life, oh God. Ezekiel knew that you could do it, God, and you knew the answer. And we thank you today, God, that we can come before you with our open hearts and our open minds today, Lord. We need you, Jesus. Bye. 
That's what this song is all about. Just, I just want you. The funny thing is, is that when I worship, I'm not looking for something to get back out of it. It's a time that I'm giving. That's what worship is. I'm giving. But I always get something back anyway. That's just the heart of God. Amen? Amen. So today is a very exciting day. Yeah. So I, I guess you know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So we're graduating John. Yeah. yeah. All right. I've grown here at the City Living Center, and uh, I'd like to thank all of my uh, roommates here in City Church uh, for all their support, and uh, this whole experience has been, been wonderful, and I've grown a lot, so thank you very much. You're welcome, John. John brought most of the family. I have a one-year coin here. I'm going to give it to his wife, and she's going to present his coin to him. to pray now for John and his family. So if you'd be so kind as, as our custom to stretch out your hand, <clears throat> we're pronouncing a blessing on his life as he's, he is going to leave. And uh, we just want God to open up all the good doors, the right doors, and close all the wrong doors and just bless him as he goes. Amen. John, congratulations. Do you know, by the way, John in Hebrew means God is gracious. Yes. Amen. Amen. This man's had plenty of it poured into his life. Hallelujah. Thank you. Let's uh, bow our heads, stretch forth your hands. The timeline is important in our lives. Where are we at? Where do we need to go? And how do we get there? And so, John, we want to pray that where you're at, we're in a good place this morning with good people here, and the Lord's presence is here. So let's pray for the next step. Where, where is he at? Where does he need to go? And how is he going to get there? Amen. And God will be carrying him by that grace that he's so, so well known for pouring out. Lord, we thank you. We stretch forth our hands. We thank you, Lord, for this year uh, that, that John has studied, learned more about you. And we just thank you, Lord, for all the graciousness that you've showed to him. God, the next step. This is where he's at. Where does he need to go? And we ask you to, to lead him, Lord, like the pillar of fire, very clear, Lord, and concisely, step by step, and that you will lead him in the way. And at the end, Lord, lift him up into glory. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. So, God, we just pronounce this blessing now in the name of Jesus. 
Go with God, John. May he watch your going out and your coming back from this time forth and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen. 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 everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. The kids can be dismissed. Y'all have a good time over there. come to the portion of the service where it's it's the deposit time yeah. Uh, yeah. come on play. I, I said it's deposit time it, this is a, this is a, this is a great opportunity this is a wonderful opportunity this is, is a time where, oh, let me say this, John came to see the church one way, he grew step by step, moment by moment, all the way up until the point that he walked up on this stage a few minutes ago, and what you see is what you get. Amen. What you see is what you get when you come to City Church 242. I say it over and over and over and over again. City Church 242 is all about it. It's all about it. We don't play around here. It's work going on here 24-7. When you see it, when you don't see it, work being going on. When you don't see it, work is being going on. So just understanding that City Church 242 is good ground. And when I say good ground, I mean that the land has been cultivated, the rocks has been taken out, the weeds have been removed, it's getting sunshine every day, it's, it's, and it's being watered constantly. I'm, I am talking about what I, not what somebody told me, but what I know. Woo! What I know. So when you make your deposit here, you, you're making, you, you, you got to know how serious your deposit is. You have to understand that when you place your money, your money, in the ground, you place your money in good ground. Good ground. And when you, and, and even if you don't come here and you're just visiting and you make a deposit here, sooner or later, you're going to see that deposit return to you. You're going to see it. Trust me when I tell you that. You're going to see it return to you in ways that you haven't even thought or imagined. It can return to you not just in money form. It can return to you with just releasing stress in your mind. It's just giving you peace in your heart. It just, it just many ways. So just understand when you give, make a decision that you're gonna give bountifully. Not just not. It's like you got a child, and you tell your child asks you for something, and you you, you say, here, take it. Don't, don't, don't give like that. Don't make that kind of deposit. When you give, you give from a cheerful heart. Be glad to give it. Be glad to give it because God 
loves a cheerful giver. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to say it again. God loves a cheerful giver. Right. So when you give from your heart, you're bountifully. Because when you're just understanding that you're not giving to be just giving. You're giving for a real purpose. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. Heavenly Father, we, we, we thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for loving us, Father. We thank you for keeping us, protecting us, and providing for us, Father. Yes. Father, it's not about us. It's all about you, Father. And Father, right now we're asking, Father, that you bless this deposit. We, and Father, I am asking for your Holy Spirit, Father. Your, let your Holy Spirit just continue to have its way. And let your anointing fall all over this place, Father. And touch hearts, Father, like you never touched them before. We give you praise and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Take me back. Take me back. Take me back to my first love. Take me back. Take me back. Take me back to my first, come on. Take me back, take me back, take me back to my first. Only you and me, God. Take me back, take me back to my first love. Take me back, take me back, take me back to my first love. Take me back, take me back, take me back to my first love. service on Wednesday night? That's right. Come 
and join us Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Come and encounter the word. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So um, we're going to jump into part two of our subject. Uh, we started last week, um, <clears throat> gender confusion. And uh, before we jump in, I, I just want to say it, it kind of went out on the internet and uh, it got a whole lot of hits and it, it got a whole lot of comments. And I, I, I believe this is the reason because most churches won't cover this subject at all. And, uh, and, and in fact, for honestly, out of the years that I have been in the ministry, I, I, was, I was doing some math today, and when you get my age, don't ever do the math because it just get, <laughs> it gets really scary. Um, but I, I realized that I have been in the ministry pastoring for 49 years and I have probably preached <clears throat> an estimated 3,500 messages. Uh, that's just a rough estimate, maybe a little more, maybe a little bit less. And I have never, ever touched this subject. Not that I know of. I, with that many messages, sometimes you touch things you don't even remember. But I don't ever remember touching this subject. And, 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 and for good reason, because it is so controversial. But, but for those of you that know me, and those of you that know this church, um, you know where our heart is at. And for those online that don't know us really well, I don't know our DNA, don't really know what we're about, that can take a message and pick out parts of it and become judgmental, um, then shame on you for doing that. Obviously, you didn't hear the end of what I had to say last week. So let me, let me just preface, before we jump in, let me just preface this, that, that we as a church, I call it DNA, uh, just who we are. We as a church, we accept everybody. Everybody. Our sign out there says, come as you are. Um, you can dress any way you want to dress. You can look any way you want to look. Uh, just don't come in naked. We may have a little problem with that. <clears throat> but you can, you can wear your shorts. You can wear your tennis. You can dress up in a suit. Uh, you, can, you can look any which way that you want to look. It's absolutely all good and all fine. You can have any lifestyle that you want, and, and you don't have to check it at the door. You can bring it in with you. <clears throat> if you're addicted, um, if you're addicted, uh, there is no shame in this house. If you've been incarcerated, there is no shame in this house. Uh, we have people that have been placed in our custody. Uh, I don't know if we have anybody right now in our custody, but occasionally we have a number of people in our custody. Um, you, have may, you may have committed some uh, heinous crimes, and uh, uh, you may be uh, same-sex attracted. You may be transgender. You may be transsexual. And I'm here to tell you it is all good in this house. There is, there is no judgment. There is no judgment in this house. I'm not here to judge. And as if you were here during the week, we had a conversation in our live-in, and just that conversation went kind of like this. There are people, as, as we come together, let's just be honest, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again, as we come together, we are broken people. Uh, we are broken people. And one of the verses we're going to look at where Paul talks about same-sex attraction, in that same verse he talks about idolatry, he talks about uh, 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 anger, he talks about talking about other people behind their back. In the same verse, he lumps it all together. 
So we come as broken people, and you might be broken in a way that I'm not broken, I might be broken in a way that you're not broken, but because I'm not broken like you, does it give me the, the, the ability to look down on you or to criticize you? Because my brokenness, though it's different than your brokenness, is the same, we are broken. There are no levels of brokenness. Broken is just broken. Without Jesus, we are broken. When we come to Jesus, we come to Jesus as broken people. So we can address certain subjects. I can tell you that uh, those of you that are married, that if you cheat on your wife or cheat on your husband, that is absolutely wrong. Don't do it. I, I can do that. I can tell you that to be jealous tell you that to speak about somebody behind their back that is wrong don't do that and if you do that there is an element of grace that you're covered by grace because we are becoming and we'll look at that verse in Corinthians we're becoming Christ-like as we're enveloped into him I want to get to that but that is the secret to change okay so today I would not be fulfilling my responsibility if I did not touch on this subject. I just wouldn't. I wrestled with it all morning. In fact, I woke up last night. I put together a whole nother message. I sat in the back during worship, panicking, going, I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. People are going to hate on me. They're going to misunderstand. They're going to talk about me. And uh, I, I just don't want to do it. God, I'm going to go, I'm going to go grab my notes and I'm going to teach on something totally different today. And, and I prayed and prayed and prayed as we were in worship. And I just felt like I am called to express the whole word of God. That's my job. And, and listen carefully, li listen carefully, especially those online that aren't here, you don't know our vibe. Listen carefully. Don't get angry at me. Get angry at the author if you're going to be mad at anybody. He wrote it. I did not write it. I am just expressing what is written. That is my job. Whether I like it or I don't like it, whether I fully understand it or don't fully understand it, whether my mind can get around it or I can't get around it, my job is to express what is written in this book. And every week I try to do the very best I can with all the ability that God has given me to do it, to do a good job in doing that one simple task. Express what he has said the way that he has said it. Now, I'm going to jump in today, and I'm breaking this down into four simple parts. It's really simple. Four simple parts, and then we're going to wrap it up. First of all, we're going to look at the Old Testament. Uh, second, we're going to look at the New Testament in what Jesus said. In what Jesus said. Then we're going to look a little bit at history. Not a lot, but just a little bit of history to pull it into context as to the world setting at that time. And then we're going to come in with what Paul said. So we're going to, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, Genesis chapter 2. And, and let me tell you why I'm thinking this subject is important. Uh, we started last week, and uh, if you missed last week, I would encourage you to go out online and uh, pick it up from, from, that way you'll know where we're at today because it's based primarily on last week. Um, but we're at a time right now where there is a sexual war going on in these United States. And if you follow the news and you follow any Instagrams and all of that stuff, you'll find that it is getting worse and worse and worse. In fact, in many ways, California is leading the way. <clears throat> there is a law that was passed by Governor Newsom recently, and uh, I believe that law is AB 957. You can Google it. You can look it up. But that law simply states that Children in grade school, children can, um, at their will, their own will, and with the coaching of their teachers within the school, if they decide that they want to choose another identity, sexual gender than what they are, they're allowed to do it. And they will be given hormone therapy, 
They will be given gender-affirming surgery. They will be given counseling as to the gender they're going into. Now, these aren't adults I'm talking about that can make a decision on their own. These are pre-adolescent children. Now, basically, the law states that the child does not have to tell its parent and the school has no responsibility to the parent. In fact, they're encouraged to keep it from the parent. And when your child, being coached by the school, being coached by those coming in from the outside to influence your children's behavior, sexual identity uh, at this early time in their life, when they're doing that to influence them, you, uh, Mr. Mom, uh, Mr. Dad, and Mrs. Mom, you have no authority whatsoever. You have no voice whatsoever. In fact, the law states that if you raise your voice in contrast, the, the school system is to report you and the city is to come in and take your child from you so they can go into whatever gender they choose without your permission, without your okay, without your guidance, without you being involved in their life at all. Now, what that says to me is that when your child goes to school, you do not have any place in their life as a parent. The school becomes, the government becomes the authority over that child. You've just given up your authority. That's where we are. And I'm not making it up. You go Google that, that bill that's been passed and you'll see that it is now law. I don't know about you, but that worries me. <laughs> it's one thing for a child to go through adolescent. It's one thing for a child to come into adulthood and decide that they have a, a, an issue with their gender. It's another thing to influence little kids. That's a whole nother ball game to me. And if I had children in the public school system, they would either be out immediately and I would be homeschooling, or at worst, I would be down there threatening the school board and it probably would get a little bit violent. Not gonna mess with my kid. They're messed up already enough as they are without adding to it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 18 through uh, 24. This is, this is in creation. And uh, it's interesting, God sets in order through creation. And it says, and the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. Now that must have been kind of comical, I don't know, I can just see Adam sitting there on a rock, and, 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 and all these goofy little things come, come parading by him, and he has to think of a name. I mean, and, 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 you know, we're so familiar with names today, we don't think twice about it, but, you know, like, uh, uh, I can just see Adam going, what, what would I call that thing? Um, patipus. Yeah, it kind of works. All right, you're a patipus. And, and he went animal by animal. Woman hadn't been created yet. In fact, why do you think that God waited to create woman until after Adam named all the animals? All you men here that are married, you know. You're, not, you're, you've got, you're, you're looking me dead in the eye. You're afraid to even look at her. I know what you're thinking. Because if God had created Eve before Adam named the animals, he'd still be naming them and they'd still be arguing over it today. <clears throat> he would say patipus and she'd say, uh-uh, uh-uh. Now, I ain't going for patipus. How would you think of that? Hey, patipus, that's stupid. They would still be at it, and we would not know the name of half of the animals in creation. Just saying. All right. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. 
but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Why did God take his rib? Why did God take his rib? Medically, men, you are short of rib. Did you know that to this day? You're short of rib. Go get an x-ray and count them. <clears throat> Why did God take his rib? Well, it's real simple. At least when I do weddings, I use this portion of scripture. And my point when I use it is, Eve was not taken from his head to be over him. She was not taken from his feet to be below him. She was taken from his side to be his companion and equal to him. That's why God chose that place in his body to take Eve and create Eve from. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib, and he, uh, he had taken out a man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and uh, she will be called woman, um, for she was taken out of man. Now, some interesting things are happening. God is in creation. God is laying out design. <clears throat> excuse me, for mankind. And the word there, when he fit, that word in the Greek is connecto. Connecto, and it, connecto is defined as the opposite of you. When God took and created man, man was one way. When God created woman, he created woman to be the opposite of man. Not that she was less intellectually, not that she was less in any other way, but she was opposite of man. And at Adam and Eve, they were biologically different in so many ways. They're biologically different. And, and the design was, the design was for them to come together as opposites and to become one. That is the design, to become one. That's the way God created it. And I don't need to get into all sexual stuff. Let your mind think about it for a minute. You get the picture. They were designed to become one and to become one flesh, okay? The coming together makes them one flesh in God's eyes. Now, now that, is, that is the design of God. That is how God created, how God destined his creation to be. Man and woman, opposites, coming together to become one. Some of you that are married, you say, well, that's kind of hard. Yeah, it is. It's hard to be one. It takes some work. But it is a reflection, Paul said, of Jesus and the church. We become the bride of Christ, becoming one with him, just like married people are to become one with each other. It takes work. It's something you work at. That's a whole nother message. <clears throat> so, let's go fast forward to the New Testament and to Jesus. Jesus was asked the question, about divorce and men and women coming together. He was asked the question. In fact, he was being put on the spot by the scholars of his day. It was a trick question that Jesus was being asked. And Jesus, when he responded, he responded by reciting the text that we just read. You'll find that in the Gospel of Mark. He recited the text from creation that we just read, and Jesus added the comment. He added this to the text. He said, and what God has joined together, let no man separate. What God has joined together, let no man separate. It was the design of God for man and woman to come together in union and become one flesh to then never separate themselves from being that one flesh. That is the design of God. 
And Jesus, Jesus recites that, but adds to it the design of God. Now, now, marriage is not man's idea, it is God's idea. All the way back to the creation of man, it is God's idea that the two come together and become one flesh. Now, Jesus was, this question came up over the subject of divorce, and those that were questioning Jesus said, well, how come under Moses' law, Mosaic law, they allow for divorce that a man can put aside his wife? And it's, it's interesting because if you, read, if you read the Talmud and you read the rabbi's interpretation of Old Testament law, you'll find that a man could put his wife away for any reason whatsoever. It, if she didn't do her hair well in the morning, he could say, your hair offends me, I want a divorce. If she burnt the dinner, he could say, I don't like the way you cook this meal, I want a divorce. Any reason that he wanted, he could divorce his wife simply by giving her a writ of divorce and delivering it to her at the gates in front of the elders. Jesus says to those asking him, Jesus said it was not so from the beginning. God never intended that. It was not so from the beginning. It was never in the intent of God. But Moses allowed it because of the hardness of your hearts. It goes like this. God is never in favor of divorce of two people who have come together ever separating their union. God is never in favor of that. It is never the will of God. But Jesus said, but there are times because of the hardness of your heart because of the hardness of your heart, it is the only way that you can go. What is hardness of heart? Hardness of heart is where one or the other or both do not want to work on the relationship. That is hardness of heart. Hardness of heart is when one said, I don't want this. I don't want you. I don't want to be in this relationship. And if that's the case, it puts the person who wants to be in the relationship, it bound, binds their life, and it binds them to a life of absolute hell when one or the other or both check out. Hardness of heart. They had a hardness of heart. They do, they do not want to work on it. It is hardness of heart. And Jesus said, because of that, under Mosaic law, you are allowed to separate and to divorce. But it was not so from the beginning. It was never God's intent. What I'm trying to do is point a picture of where God's heart is at. Okay? God's heart is that his creation works the way he intended it to work. But you and I and society, people, since the fall of man, we have screwed that up so bad. And when we come to Christ, he is trying to put it back together through grace. All right, let's look at the Old Testament. You with me so far? <laughs> under Mosaic law, under Mosaic law, Levitic, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, says this, Do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman, for that is detestable. It was not according to God's design. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13, says, If a man lies with a woman as one lies, if a man lies with a man as one, one lies with a woman. Both of them have done what is detestable. Detestable. In fact, under Levitical law, they were, they were sentenced to death. Both were sentenced to death. Now, in our society, that is a very hard verse. When we look at Levitical law and the severity of that. Okay, now... I've read so much on this subject, it, 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 I, my mind is just explodes now. But I have spent, like I said last, 
last week, I don't know, 13 years now studying this. One of the arguments, theological arguments, is this. Well, you can ask, well, Pastor, what about monogamous, loving relationship between two of the same sex? What about that? Would, 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 would Leviticus address that? What, what about, did they not take that into account? No, they didn't take that into account. It's not mentioned, and it's not mentioned simply because under Levitical law, there's no reference to it being consensual or non-consensual because that wasn't the issue. The issue was they couldn't do it. Consensual or non-consensual, it made no difference. <clears throat> now, the Jewish nation of Israel, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they were not prudes. They were separated unto God, but they were not prudes as to what was happening in society. They did not have blinders on their eyes. Let me tell you two of their neighboring nations. The Assyrian and the Greco-Roman world at that time, at that time, same-sex relation was not only accepted, but it was absolutely encouraged. It was a way of life. In fact, within both cultures, here's a distinct difference between then and today. Within both of those cultures, same-sex relationships had a, had a status or had a, a social hierarchy meaning those that were of importance, those that were of wealth, those that were leaders within the army, they always took the top position. Those that were lesser of the two took bottom position. And any time that order was disrupted, both would be ousted by society and become an outcast of society. Same-sex relationships were rampant in these two cultures that surrounded the Israelites. Absolutely rampant. Accepted. But the difference was is that in, in male-to-male relationships, the male re retained their male identity through the sexual relationship. They never, they never lost identity to the fact that they were a male. They, they stood as a male in society. And today, that, ha that is different. Today it's different in that same-sex relationship has become its own culture to where they, it's become a style of dress. It's become a style of acting. It's become a, a way of talking. It's a way of behavior. It's become its own culture. And there's been a culture that has been birthed around same-sex relationship. And we now have major movements. Lesbian, trans, movements that have swept this country and continues to. Within the Roman, the Greek Roman Empire, it was common for men to have relations with little boys. In fact, it was so common that it was accepted and encouraged men that were in military, men that were political leaders, men that had wealth, would take young boys from families that were poor, not doing well, and the young boy would go to live with that man in his family, in his house. And the man's job was to teach that young boy all about art, politics, fighting, language, culture, and all of that was done in exchange for sex. Totally accepted. Now today, people that do anything like that become a registered sex offender. But in their day, it was not only accepted, it was encouraged. 
It was common to see men walking hand in hand with their protege, a youth in that day. It was common. In fact, it was actually, it was actually a status symbol to have a little boy as your sex companion. It was a status symbol. There were renowned men of the day that had ongoing relationships. Agathon was a Greek poet who had a long-standing relationship. Plato had a gay relationship, long-standing relationship. Hermenides had long-standing relationship with a man. Achilles' heel, the great warrior, had relationships with other men and boys. Patropus had relationships with other men. Why am I giving you history? I'm trying to give you history so that you don't think that the Israelites did not know what was going on around them and what the norm was in society. They're fully aware of it. Now I'm going to go, I'm going to, go to number four, Paul. Paul in the New Testament. Paul touches on this subject three times in the New Testament. And I'm going to read them to you. The first one is in Romans chapter 1, verse 23 through 27. Romans chapter 1, verse 23 through 27. I'll get there. I don't have a cheater Bible like some of you where you just go to the tab. I'm really getting there. I'm a little slow today, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm really slow today. Okay, I'm going to drop to, I'm going to drop to 24, start at verse 24. This is why God lifted off the restraining hand and let them have full expression of their sinful and shameful desires. They were given over to moral depravity, to dishonoring their bodies by sexual perversions among themselves. All because they traded the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served the things, the things that God made rather than the God who made all things. Glory and praise to him forever and ever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to their own disgraceful and vile passions, inflamed with lust for one another. Men and women ignored the natural order and exchanged normal sexual relationships for homosexuality. Women engaged in lesbian conduct and men committed shameful acts with men, receiving in themselves the due penalty of their deviation. Now I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Oh, Lord. I got them all mixed up. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 6. Paul is making the point that they rejected God in what God had created. They rejected God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, says, Surely you must know that people who practice evil cannot possess God's kingdom realm. Stop being deceived. People who continue to engage in sexual immorality, we could touch on each of these individually, what is sexual immorality? It's sleeping with people that you're not married to. So if you're banging your girlfriend or boyfriend, don't be looking over at the person that has same-sex relationship as they're any less. All sex outside of the context of marriage is against God's order. It's that simple. I don't care how you define it, how you play it, how you reason it out, it's against God's order. Adultery, sexual perversion, 
That's male prostitution, by the way. Homosexuality. Notice what he puts it with. Fraud, greed, drunkenness, verbal abuse, which is slander, or extortion. These will not inherit God's kingdom realm. It is true that some of you once lived those lifestyles, but now you've been purified from sin, made holy, and given a perfect standing before God. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying, let's be honest. Some of you did this, but what happens when you come to Christ? When you come and you give your life to Jesus, he has purified you. He makes you free from sin. He makes you holy. And he gives you a perfect standing before God. All because of the power of the same Lord Jesus, the Messiah, through our union with the Spirit of our God. That's what he does. He takes the way that you are. He takes what you have done what you become, and when you give your life to him, what he does is he hides it under the blood of the cross, and you are completely forgiven. Whatever it is, you are completely forgiven. You are made whole. You are made holy. You are made righteous in his eyes. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you killed somebody, you murdered somebody, you ruined your family, you cheated on everybody you've been with. It, once you give your life to Jesus, all of that gets buried in complete forgiveness as though it's never happened. The word homosexual did not enter our Bible until 1946. That's because it was not even a word until 1888. And it was, it was a German that came up with that word. And in 18, I believe it was 1894, uh, it came to the United States. And it became its own identity then. Prior to that, it was labeled sin throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament using some Greek words uh, that, that, that defined how it was but didn't name it exactly until, until the year of 1946. It appears now in our, in our Bible. So let me, let me kind of, you may agree with me, you may not agree with me, and I guess that's okay. But I'm going to tell you what I think and what I believe the Bible indicates. Because where do you go from here? Same-sex attraction is not a sin. Okay? Same-sex attraction is not a sin. O opposite Heterosexual sexual attraction is not a sin. Sexual orientation is not a sin. It's not a sin. I don't believe that that is a sin. You, you think the way you think. You are who you are. A lot of it has to do with the way you've been up, you brought up. Some of it has to do with something that has happened in your life. Something that has happened in pre-puberty. Something that has happened as your first sexual uh, experience has set, has set a path for you that you had no control over. Some of you have dealt in areas of pornography that has kind of wet your appetite. And as it did, you, 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 you dealt deeper and deeper and deeper until you found that you were entrenched in it. It could be a number of things that made you who you are. You are a complicated individual. We are all complicated. There is no cookie cutter. But because you are who you are, and you feel the way you feel, and you think the way you think, that in and of itself is not wrong. But it's what you do with it that makes it wrong. Let me put it this way. As a heterosexual male, 
married, married, if I'm in the store and some, some, some cute gal comes up to me and, 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 and flirts with me, and, 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 and when she does, I, I, I look and go, that's a good-looking woman, right? And, and there is that, is there, there, there's that attraction there. Is that sin? No, because I wouldn't be a heterosexual male if I wasn't attracted to women. So there, and those of you that say you're not, you're just lying, okay? So stop it. Just knock it off. Y'all, y'all do this when a cute girl's going down the sidewalk and you're driving. Well, I ain't going to look again. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> and then you get to tell your wife, I don't know how I ran into him. That guy hit the brakes right in front of me. Oh, my gosh, I couldn't stop. Well, yeah, you were kind of, so you get what I'm saying. Billy Graham said, it's not the first look that's sin, it's the second look that becomes sin. Okay, that's where lust begins to develop. Okay. So this girl flirts with me, and I look and go, oh, that's a cute girl. Oh, wow, yeah, she's very attractive. That, that, that is not a sin. But, but when I walk up to her, and I give her my phone number, and she gives me her phone number, oh, I'm on a slippery slope. Now, I can sit there and say, having her phone number is not a sin. I'll just leave it right here on my desk. Well, wait a minute. I'll cover it with my Bible so Deborah never finds out. <clears throat> and then one day, one day, I don't like the way she's treating me. Uh, yeah, I still got that phone number. Uh, it's not a sin. I can have a phone number. It's just another phone number. Get over it. But then I call her. And then we go decide to go have lunch. And then lunch turns into a hug. Then it turns into a kiss. Then it turns into, where do you live? You, you, you get the drill, right? You get the drill. At, one po at what point in that progress does it become sin? Is having lunch with another female sin? Not at all. Is asking her, where do you live? Is that a sin? Not at all. I haven't taken my clothes off yet. But at some point in that progress, I've crossed the line. And when I've crossed the line, I'm headed for the inevitable, and it is sin. Okay, so feelings in and of themselves are not sin. It's what you do with it that determines at what point it becomes sin. It's what you do with it. I'm going to leave you with this. 2 Corinthians, this is, this is important. 2 Corinthians. And I'm looking at chapter 5 and verse 17 through verse 19. Some people would say, well, I'm homosexual, I'm same-sex attracted. Does that mean I can never have a relationship? Well, I don't want to leave you with doom and gloom. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you 2 Corinthians. Paul, Paul talks about something that happens in Christ. Now, if anyone... If anyone, the word here, I love this word. I've highlighted it in my Bible. If anyone is enfolded, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, enfolded into Christ, what does enfolded mean? I think we touched on this months ago. Enfolded is to be like wrapped in a blanket, not just a blanket. Deborah... Sometimes I can't sleep well, so I go, I go down on the couch area. And Deborah makes sure that I have a blanket there in case I get up in the middle of the night. What she fails to realize is that it's not a blanket. It, when I put it on, it doesn't come together. 
to keep me warm. And when I laid down, if I lay down for a minute, I got to hold it together because it doesn't even touch. She's real cheap that way. <laughs> Meanwhile, I go look at her in bed and she's got my side and her side of the bed and she's got blankets piled up all around her falling off the bed like there's this overabundance of blanket and I got my little handkerchief trying to keep warm, right? <clears throat> And folded would be me taking her blanket to where I could wrap it around and wrap it around and I'm, I, I'm, I'm snuggled in, in these blankets. That is the word enfolded. You don't become enfolded in Christ by coming to church periodically. You, you don't come in, become enfolded in Christ by having a Sunday relationship with Jesus. You're enfolded in Christ by an in-depth relationship every day with Jesus as he's guiding and, and has the, he is the author and the authority over your life. That's being enfolded in Christ. All around, in and out, all tucked in. I am, I am protected by my big blanket from all the elements of the world. It could be snow outside, but I'm warm inside because I'm enfolded in Christ. He said, he has become an entirely new person. He's become an entirely new person. Enfolded in Christ creates in you a new person. It is not my job to change you. It is not, in many ways, it's not your job to change you because you can't. That's where the church makes a mistake. Well, brother, pray about it. Just get over it. We'll just cast the devil out of you. You know, you know it don't work. If you're, if you're in a heterosexual relationship and, and, and you're addicted to porn, you just can't get away from it, I can tell you every day, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. You're still going to do it. Because you can't change you. And the sexual desire is the strongest desire in a human being. That and saving your life. They're the two strongest desires that you deal with. Now, if I told you don't worry about your life and I pointed a gun at you and said run or I shoot, guess what? You're going to run. You're going to run really fast because your natural instinct kicks in. i got to save my life. I am running. I'm out of here. It's the same thing with sexual desire. Your ability to control it is almost nil. But when you're enfolded in Christ, he has become an entirely new person. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. What is the answer to addiction? You can go to NA, you can go to AA, you can go to CR. That's all good. They're all good. And God bless them. But if you're going to those and you're not becoming enfolded in Christ, chances are you're not going to change the way that you should. Now, if you want to be enfolded in Christ and go to those, you will change immensely quickly. Because that is the answer to brokenness. Broken people simply go to the creator, to the one who created them, and say, I am broken. I don't know how to fix me. I don't know how to be a different person. I need you to fix me and make me the way you created me to be. And... <clears throat> I'm going to be enfolded in you because I'm depending on you to do it. I need you to do it. 
I want you to do it. I want to be what you created me to be. I want, I want my brokenness to be healed. And when you do that, and you're enfolded in Christ, something begins to happen because he reaches deep inside of you and he heals stuff that needs to be healed. He takes out stuff that needs to be taken and he makes you what you were created to be. Everything is fresh and new and God has made all things new and reconciled do you know what reconciled means? It means to bring back. That's reconciled. Like in a, in a relationship that's gone south, what does the counselor do? He tries to reconcile the two back together. And reconciled us to himself. Reconciled us to himself. And then guess what? He's given He's given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. You've been reconciled. You've been enfolded. You've been reconciled to God. God is doing something in your life. He now commissions you to go and reconcile other people to God. That's what we're doing this morning. We are not judging, we are not condemning, we're not browbeating. There's not a person in this room that has the right to do that. Just look at your own life and you'll see why. You don't have a right to do that. That's why, that's why we say everybody come to church. Come as you are. We want to enfold you into Jesus. And let Jesus do what only Jesus can do. Now, some of us, we've been enfolded a lot longer and a lot deeper than others. So be careful that we don't judge others as they're along that road of reconciliation, as they're along that road of being enfolded into Christ. Don't judge them for where they're at. You didn't get there overnight. I didn't get there overnight. I still got a long way to go. But we're on the journey together, aren't we? We're on the journey together. That's why we call each other brothers. That's why we call each other sisters. It doesn't matter what, what you are dealing with in life. Somebody said, well, pastor, what about that person that's... Uh, Loaded. Should we tell them they can't come to church? Go get them. Bring them in. Put them right in the front row. Because I'm going to tell them that they can be reconciled. I'm going to tell them they can be enfolded in Christ. And they're not going to have to go out and get intoxicated to feel okay anymore. Because that's the answer to addiction. That's the answer to what breaks us. That's the answer to anger problems, jealousy problems. That's the, that's the answer to lust. That's the answer to relationships that ought not to be. That's the answer to it, is being enfolded in Christ. He's the only one I know that's qualified to mend brokenness. I don't know, I, honestly. Like I said, I've been, I've, been, I've been 49 years pastoring. And it's taken me 49 years to come to a place to where I say nothing else works. Everything else is just Band-Aids because nothing touches the heart of a man, the heart of a woman, other than the Creator, God Himself. He created you. Do you believe that? Do you think He knows where to touch you? Absolutely. Absolutely. He knows you better than you know yourself. And it's when you trust him and you enfold yourself in him, that's where change takes place. Amen. Let's stand to get to this morning. And I'm going to invite you, if you're here this morning and you're looking at your life and you can see where there's brokenness, you can see where 
things are out of joint and they need to be put together. I'm going to ask you that as the worship team leads us and we close, that you just, in all honesty, transparency, say to God, God, I want you to heal my brokenness. I'm going to engulf myself in you. I want you to heal my brokenness. Make me whole of what ails me. And then see what starts happening in your life. Amen? Amen.
Father, we just thank you, God, that you are a loving God, Lord God. We know we are broken, God, and that's why we came to you, God, because you are the author of life. You created us, Lord God, in your image, Father God. You created us in your likeness, Lord God. And as we ask, God, that you fix what is wrong with us, Lord God. And as we walk, Lord God, with you in us, Father God, may we shine that light to others, Lord God, who are struggling as well, who was, who are walking in the shoe where we once was, Lord God. Help us to shine that light and to do what you ask us to do, to spread the good news, Lord God, the good news to them that there is hope, there is life, there is you, Jesus. And you, you are the answer to our problems, Lord God. You, Lord God, your love. Help us to spread your love, God, as you have reached out to us with your love and saved us and changed us and loved us.